we'll walk through verses 11 through 15. I'm going to share my screen. And then as I do that, I'll bring up the presentation for everybody. So this is uh, the doctrine of hell. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. And let me go ahead and, and get us launched here and take us through an intro. Uh, hell has disappeared and no one noticed. Uh, these words came from the respected American church historian, Martin Marty, in the latter part of the 20th century. To some degree, we must judge his assessment as correct, though that does not mean people have completely removed hell from their mind or their tongue. Um, you know, there are movies that try to deal with it in a way that, that aren't the best, but uh, let me just take you through a little bit of American, recent American history on hell. In January 1987, Insight Magazine ran an article entitled, Hell Hath Little Fury These Days. In that article, the following judgments were given. Alan Bernstein, who was a professor of medieval history, he said, hell today is enveloped in silence. Donald, uh, here the theologian, uh, said the doctrine of hell has passed out of conversation and preaching, even in conservative evangelical churches. U.S. News and World Report in March 25, 1991, in their cover story, The Rekindling of Hell, and a lead article entitled Hell's Sober Comeback, they noticed that three in five Americans, 60% of Americans believed in hell, up 53% from 1981, 54% in 1965. 58% in 1952. Interestingly, only 4% believe they had a good or excellent chance of, of going there. Hell is real for many. It's just no one, at least not me, is going to be there. That's, that's how a lot of people think as they uh, work through this. Uh, in July 1997, the Dallas Morning News ran a point-counterpoint article entitled, How's Hell Frozen Over? Representing the sentiments of modern liberal theology, Lonnie Cliver, a chairman of the Department of Religious Studies at SMU, said the idea that God would have created the world knowing, much less predestinating, that some of his creatures would suffer in hell forever in hell is incompatible with the God of unlimited power and love. Belief in an eternal hell is, in the final analysis, an admission that evil is stronger than good, that hate is deeper than love. So that's the liberal take on it. Former Evangelical Clark Pinnock, who used to be a professor at Southwestern, no, at uh, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and, and then he ended up going uh, atheistic later uh, in his years, uh, former evangelical. He likewise finds the traditional view of hell repulsive and unworthy of God, the God that he envisions, opting for annihilationism. That's the view that you just annihilate, you cease to exist. Um, he says, how can Christians possibly project a deity of such cruelty and vindictiveness whose ways include inflicting everlasting torture upon his creatures, however sinful they may have been? Um, surely a God who would do such a thing is, is more nearly like Satan than like God. I'm quoting Clark Pinnock here, at least by any ordinary moral standards. Everlasting torment makes God into a bloodthirsty monster who maintains an everlasting Auschwitz for victims whom he does not even allow to die. How is one to worship or imitate such a cruel and merciless God? I consider the concept, the concept of hell as endless torment in body and mind and outrageous doctrine, which needs to be changed. And those are the words of Clark Pinnock. Uh, so many that have weighed in. Fast forward to 1999, the Pope issues a statement from the Vatican announcing this, hell is not a punishment imposed externally by God, but the condition resulting from attitudes and actions which people adopt in this life. More than a physical place, hell is a state of those who freely and definitively separate themselves from God, the source of all life and joy. So what the Pope is saying here is hell is not an eternal place of torment. It's something we bring on ourselves in this life through our decisions. And so eternal damnation is not God's work, but is actually our own doing. Hell is the pain, frustration, and emptiness of a life without God. And so the Pope's statement ignited a firestorm of reaction. It was Dr. Moeller, the, the seminary president where I attended seminary, he responded in 1999 with, should we lose the fear of hell? The Pope redefines the doctrine. In the article, he writes this, the Pope's denial of the traditional Christian understanding of hell is one more step in a progressive rejection of the very real and very horrible picture of hell revealed in the Bible. 
The temptation to quote air conditioned hell as one Catholic magazine puts it, is constant in a secular world that rejects hell as outdated and promises some kind of vague harmonic convergence in the afterlife. In popular culture, hell has gone the way of the hula hoop. It simply does not fit the modern secular mind. And I've got a few more quotes here, and then we'll dive into our study. British novelist David Lodge once remarked at some point in the 1960s, hell disappeared. No one could say for certain when this happened. First, it was there, then it wasn't. Different people became aware of the disappearance of hell at different times. Though Americans poke fun at hellfire and brimstone sermons, you're not likely to hear one in most pulpits, where hell has been conveniently domesticated for popular consumption. In liberal Protestantism, the traditional concept of hell is simply denied and demythalized, um, and some evangelicals, the preferred practice is simply to preach the promise of heaven and avoid hell at all costs. And I've, I've known ministries that have made that emphasis, and it's, it's a sad thing to see. Polls consistently reveal that most Americans believe in heaven and believe they are going there. Far fewer believe in hell, and almost no one believes he is headed there. So modern Americans are quite certain that their democratic deity wouldn't do anything so rash is to consign their neighbors to eternal punishment, much less themselves. So Newsweek in 1999 had again reported of those polled only 3% believe they will be going to hell. However, as interesting and as fascinating as all this is, the most important question still remains to be answered. What does the Bible say about hell? And co complementing that question, um, you know, is what did Jesus teach about it? Did Jesus say anything about it? And of course, we all know he did. We will quickly survey the Gospels to answer the latter question about what did Jesus say, and then we will turn to Revelation 20, 11 through 15 to answer the former. So let's talk about Jesus and his discussions about hell, his sermons and verses here. Jesus spoke more often about hell than any other person in the Bible. The Greek word Gehenna is found 12 times in the New Testament. It is always translated as hell. Christ used the word 11 times. The only other mention is in James 3, 6, in reference to the tongue. Christ warned his listeners to be afraid of Gehenna and claimed that only God has the power to cast humans into it. He testified that both the soul and the body could enter Gehenna. The unsaved could go there with two eyes, two hands, and two feet, and it is a place marked by fire. And so we also have, in contrast, uh, between the sheep, the saved, and the goats, the unsaved, Christ said that the unsaved eventually would go into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Summarizing the teachings of Jesus on hell using Matthew 25, 31 through 46 as a primary text, Don Whitney, who's also a um, professor at Southern Seminary, he says that Jesus taught these based on that text. Number one, hell is real. Number two, hell is separation from God. Number three, hell is for all of the accursed ones. Four, hell is eternal. Uh, five, hell is fire. Six, hell is a prepared place. Seven, hell is eternity with a devil and his angels. Uh, eight, hell is inevitable if you have never come to Christ. Number nine, hell is in inescapable once you're there. And then number 10, hell is avoidable if you will repent and believe in Jesus Christ. So again, all that comes from Matthew 25, 31 through 46. You can add to this Luke 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. I have a sermon in the archives on that text from about five, six years ago now, uh, where I went very slowly through that and, and taught the doctrine of hell on a Sunday morning. And you can find that, I think, on YouTube under our church's uh, channel. It becomes clear when you study that passage uh, that our Lord believed hell was real. He leaves no room for either universalism, the belief that all will eventually be saved, or annihilationism there, that all who are lost will go into non-existence. And so Robert Murray McChain, we read through the Bible using his plan, I think it was two years ago, he got it right when he said this, the dying of the Lord Jesus is the most awakening sight in the world. Why did that lovely one that was from the beginning, the brightness of his father's glory and the express image of his person degrade himself so much as to become as a small corn of wheat, which is hidden under the earth and dies. Why did he lie down in the cold, rocky sepulcher? Would Christ have wept over Jerusalem if there had been no hell beneath it? Would he have died under the wrath of God if there were no wrath to come? 
Oh, triflers with the gospel and polite hearers who say often, sir, we would see Jesus, but who never find him. Go to Gethsemane, see his unspeakable agonies. Go to Golgotha, see the vial of wrath poured out, uh, poured upon his breaking heart. Go to the sepulcher and see the, quote, corn of wheat laid dead in the ground. Why all the suffering in the spotless one if there is no wrath coming on the unsheltered, unbelieving head? And so just to pause there, the, the, the gospel makes no sense at all if you remove hell from the equation. What is Christ really saving us from if hell is not something that exists? Why did he die on the cross at all? There's so many things that fall apart. So let me give you the context of our passage for tonight. As we've been working verse by verse through Revelation, the wicked are judged at the return of Christ in chapter 19, where it says the rest were killed and they are denied resurrection at the beginning of the millennium. Uh, and so in 24 through 6, as we've been studying that, last week we studied the, the, the various views of the millennium. Following the millennium, the wicked are pulled back from the realm of the dead when Satan is also released from his prison. And so they are duped once again into following the deceiver in a final act of rebellion before being decisively defeated. And at the end of chapter 20, verse 10, the drama seems to be complete with all God's enemies vanquished. As a result, our verses tonight can be seen to provide further details of the judgment already mentioned in verse nine of our chapter. In other words, 24 through 10 and 20, 11 through 15 are really two versions of the same event, the final judgment of the wicked. None of those facing the judgment in 20, 11 through 15 will have their names included in what the Bible calls the book of life. Those whose names are recorded have already been raised from the dead and made ready for eternal life in the new heaven and new earth. In many ways, chapter 24 through 10 offers the positive side of the final judgment, while 20 verses 11 through 15 presents tonight the negative side. And so let's go ahead and dive into the text. If you have your Bibles open, I'm going to be reading tonight from the, um, the Holman Christian Bible, I think the, um, the, uh, the Christian Standard Bible. They took Holman out uh, of the uh, HCSB as they have updated and modernized it. So let me go ahead and read Revelation 20, 11 uh, through 15. This is our passage for tonight. We'll dive into this passage right now. Uh, then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence and no one was found for them. No place was found for them. Sorry. I also saw the dead, the great and small standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. In verses 13 and 14, let me just read them. Then the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each one was judged according to their works. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and this is the second death, the lake of fire. Verse 15, and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Um, I'm going to give some commentary, and then when I'm done with the study, we'll open up the uh, airwaves and, and do some Q&A, and, and everyone can you know ask questions. We'll talk about the passage, and uh, let's dive in, though, and, and go back through the text with some commentary. Verse 11, we're going to do a slow burn through these verses, and I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. Uh, John is the one recording this, and John says when he, when he saw, it, it, that's a statement he's used all throughout the book, and, and many believe there is a succession of order here where these happen chronologically. So what follows here takes place after the millennium and the final rebellion by Satan that showed up in verse 9 and 10. Uh, he sees the one seated on the throne, right, the great white throne. That has to be the Lord Jesus, and why do we believe it's the Lord Jesus? Well, the New Testament tells us quite a bit about that. Let's look at these verses in John 5, 22. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in his, uh, himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. And so that is a very clear reference that Jesus will be the one judging us and seated on the white throne judgment there. Uh, in Acts 10, 42, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he, Jesus, who was ordained by God to be judge 
of the living and the dead. A uh, few more verses. Second Timothy 4, 1 Timothy 4.1, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead as is appearing in his kingdom. And so the great white throne has seated on it Jesus. It's a great throne. That's speaking of the, the dignity of the judge. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the, also the extent of his judgment. It's a white throne uh, that symbolically in apocalyptic literature like Revelation refers to purity, holiness, and justice of the one seated there. And then the throne, there's a sovereign majesty and authority, uh, regalness to the throne, um, to the one seated on it. Look at Psalm 9, 7, and 8. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness, and he shall administer judgment for the peoples in uprightness. And so this psalm is looking forward to that day when Christ will judge the nations. As we keep reading in verse 11, earth and heaven fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. So earth and heaven here fled from his presence. This expresses the fear of corruptible creation before the presence of God in anticipation of the new uh, heavens and new earth coming in chapter 21. The scene is very unnerving as everything in all of creation flees from its creator and tries to run. What is to follow at this throne is terrifying for any of us to imagine. Unbelievers in their own righteousness will stand before the sinless, perfect, holy savior whom they have rejected. And words cannot capture the horror of this moment. There, there will be no advocate for them in this moment, nothing that can stand in their stead. In verse 12, it says, I also saw the dead and great, uh, the great and the small standing before the throne. The books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the book. So we see here hell is an equal opportunity provider and, and maybe offender for the spiritually dead because he sees the great and the small standing before the throne. Those without Christ are called the dead uh, in this passage, 11 through 15, four times in the, our text tonight. Dead or death occurs seven times in our text tonight. You might also note small and great dead ones are here. Uh, these are the small and great. Your status in this life, your accomplishments and accolades in this life will count for zero when you stand before the great white throne. And so we see that in this passage. Hell will not equally uh, not be equally hot and terrible for everyone. There will be degrees of punishment. And so that question gets asked a lot. Is there going to be different degrees of judgment there? There seems to be, through some of the words of Jesus, yeah, a bit of, of, of a different level of judgment of some, some way. And, and so we don't fully know. We don't have it all spelled out. But let's hear the words of Jesus and see what he had to say. Look at Matthew 10, 14 and 15. Whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from that house or city. Shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So it seems to say here that, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah are going to get a, a, a nicer pass, uh, you know, into hell. Uh, they're going to have a, a less um, judgy area of hell, it seems like, where, where if you reject the disciples, it's going to be a worse day of judgment. Uh, he says it again, uh, Matthew 11, 21 through 24, in a very different way. Woe to you, Teresan. Woe to you, Bethsaida, for the if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades, to hell. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it should be more tolerable, tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. And so you, you have these different uh, levels of judgment, it seems like. Mark 12, and then he said to them in his teaching, beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes. They love greetings in the marketplaces. They love the best seats in the synagogues and the best places at feasts. They devour widows' houses and, and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater judgment, greater condemnation. You might remember in James in a very different format, speaking of those within the church, teachers will receive a more severe judgment. For, for believers, we will not be judged for our sin. We will be judged for our obedience in Christ. And praise God for that. But um, there will be different levels, it seems, uh, as we study what Jesus says. So yes, 
there will be varying degrees of punishment, but everyone in hell will suffer terribly and, and miserably in a place where nothing good is present. So no matter what level or wherever you end up or how it works out, no one wants to, you, you know, you don't want to go there. You, no one will want to be there. It says here in verse 12, the books were opened. And so these books, we believe, and scholars looking at commentaries, they, I don't know, they all believe these books of works. Uh, these are books of the works of their lives, which contain the record of every thought, act, and emotion of every unsaved person. And so you have some verses that speak to this. Psalm 40, 421, would not God search this out, for he knows the secrets of the heart. Ecclesiastes 12, 14, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Matthew 12, 37, for by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Matthew 16, 27, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. There's so many verses here that speak to this. Luke 8, 17, for nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Romans 2, 16, in that the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So everything's going to be laid open. Everything will be made bare before God. Punishment and hell with, will fit the sins. No one will call God unfair or unjust when his heavenly video recorder plays back. You know, this is your life. These books will tell one side of the story, but another book will tell the other side. Either you will be judged through the books that will be opened or you're a part of the book of life. So I love that another book was opened in verse 12, which is the book of life. And you should know pretty well what this corresponds to. This corresponds to the ancient idea of a divine register and also to the registry of citizens in ancient cities. And biblically speaking, it contains the record of the names of all persons who have trusted and received Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so we see it all through Revelation. We also see it in Philippians 3, verse 20, which says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, if your name is in the book of life, it will not be in the book of works. So um, that's not the verse. Uh, that, that's actually commentary now. But if your name is in the book of works, it will not be in the book of life. Either you're in the book of works or you're in the book of life in our text for tonight. And so in Revelation 20, verse 13, then the sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each one was judged according to their works. So John MacArthur says this, preaching that downplays God's wrath does not enhance evangelism, it undermines it. One survey of, of an evangelical seminary, their students revealed that nearly half of them felt preaching about hell to unbelievers is in poor taste. And so God's wrath is a reality, a reality never more evident than that the judgment of the great white throne, it must be something as believers that we keep warning folks of and we keep preaching in our churches. In verse 13, it says, then the sea, uh, and we've read this verse already um, a couple of times, the sea gave up the dead that were in it, the, the death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, each one was judged according to their works. So God's summons now goes out to all the sea, death, which claims the body, and Hades, which uh, some interpreters believe claims the soul. So every speck of dust, every particle that makes up the bodies of the unsaved will be regathered and reformed when they stand, quote, naked before the Savior. Uh, they will probably uh, be clothed, but they will be uh, bare as far as all of their works. With resurrected bodies fit for hell, they will all, from every corner of the earth, stand before God. And each one was judged according to their works. So God's standard is applied to all. And a second time, we we're told they were judged, each one according to his works. So how will the unsaved be judged from the books? How is that going to happen? There's three answers I want to give to that. First, by how they responded to the word of God, which we know that they rejected. Jesus says in John 12, 48, the one who rejects me and doesn't receive my sayings has this as his judge. The word I have spoken will judge him on the last day. And so those that have rejected Christ, uh, that their own statements will stand against them and, and will be played out. Even if people never read the word of God, they will still be without excuse. And this is, this is something that goes into that very dark question. What about those that have never heard the gospel? The Bible makes it clear that all are without excuse because everyone has some understanding of God from nature and from birth and from their conscience. And, and we have it where Romans 2, 14 through 16 tells us that God's law is written on our hearts. 
and the revelation of God could be discerned in their consciences from creation. And so God has revealed himself to all the creation through his law written on their hearts and through creation, and they are without excuse. Um, and so how would the unsaved be judged from the books? Uh, second, their own words will judge them. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. I believe it was Francis Schaeffer that, that just gave the clear illustration. All God would have to do for anybody in heaven is just play a tape recorder of everything that they've ever spoken in this life, and, and that, would, that would be enough to judge them and condemn them. We would all be embarrassed if, if we were without Christ and had our tapes played. How will the unsaved be judged from the books? Third, by their own works that will judge them. All the evil that people have thought, said, or done will be manifested and properly rewarded in that day with judgment. So concerning the wicked, one writer put it this way, back they will come with faces wrecked and ruined by sin and with souls knotted and gnarled, shriveled and shorn by lust and hate, envy and scorn, passion and pride, iniquity and crime. Back they will come to be judged according to their works. And that comes from John Phillips commentary on Revelation. So the Bible is very clear, be sure your sin will find you out everyone's sin will be made known on the day of judgment for the non-believer. Verse 14, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Now, with this verse, I had to get a quote from Jonathan Edwards, from Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, the most famous American sermon ever preached, and it was about hell. Um, this is what he says, the pit is prepared, the fire is made ready, the furnace is now hot, ready to receive them. The flames do now rage and glow. The glittering sword is wet and held over them, and the pit has opened her mouth under them. O oh, sinner, consider the fearful danger you are in. You know, Jonathan Edwards gets a bad rap sometimes in American English classes. He was a solid Christian, a solid believer. I believe the greatest theologian America has ever produced, and so I defend Jonathan Edwards. Uh, C. E. Autry, who was an evangelism professor at um, the Southwestern Baptist Theological, let me give you his quote. He says this, it is an unworthy motive to preach on hell to frighten people into the family of God. We preach it because it tenders the hearts of the Christians and creates within them a concern for the lost people. No redeemed child of God can look through the eyes of the scriptures at the awful glaring destiny of the lost and not have a grave concern about the sinners on their way to eternal damnation. The mantle of the prophet falls upon the shoulders of a preacher who can look through the eyes of the great doctrine at a lost world. And that was the professor of evangelism at Southwestern uh, Seminary in 1957. Uh, as we finish uh, these last two verses, we have where death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Again, some believe death and Hades could be the, the body and the soul joined together and then cast into the fire. It's hard to fully know, but that's the, the going uh, interpretation by many. Um, and then you have the second death being mentioned here, spiritual death. This is the eternal death of someone, permanent separation forever from God, alone. There's, there's no way out. The gulf is fixed. There's no second chance, no way that once they get into that lake, they will make it out of that. Uh, Timothy George said, hell for me would be I would never see God. That would be the greatest punishment. In one sense, though, in Psalm 139, uh, it says there, if I make my bed in hell, you're still there. Uh, so God is there, but the lost will have no sense of his presence other than that of his wrath in hell. In Revelation 20, verse 15, and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So they experienced the suffering of fire. The question is asked, is the fire literal? Um, I don't really want to find out, but whatever it is, if it's literal or non-literal, it's worse than anything you could ever imagine. Whenever the Bible uses pictures of hell, usually the reality is worse than what can be put into language. And so um, there's never a place where in scripture, when something is described, it, it turned out less than how it was described. It's going to be harsher than, than what Christ was able to put into language. Language is like this leaves no room for any form of universal salvation or soul sleep or an intermediate state of purgatory, a second chance or annihilation of the wicked. This is the eternal infliction of punishment resulting in the physical and mental misery mentioned by Jesus. 
the wicked will be tormented without rest, day and night, forever and ever, and we're told in Revelation 14, 11. Remember, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And so let me give you three modern applications from this passage. How do we apply what we are studying tonight uh, to our lives, and how do, we, how do we live with this? We need to know unbelievers will face God's eternal judgment. While the very last part of Revelation speaks about all the wonderful things God has in store for his people, this passage tonight provides a very sobering reminder to all of us of the punishment awaiting those who rebel against God. And while some would like to find support for the doctrine of annihilation in Revelation, again, that's the belief that the wicked will be destroyed, they will cease to exist once they're thrown into the fiery lake. The book seems to teach the eternal conscious punishment of the wicked. And so in Revelation 14, 9 through 11, and 20, 20, we find that the phrase is torment and night and day and forever and ever uh, show up. And these are phrases that suggest eternal judgment and eternal torment, conscious torment. The main point, however, is more than a theological argument between eternal conscious torment versus annihilationism. The, although the word hell is often thrown around in our society as a curse or an exclamation, the Bible clearly teaches the reality of hell as the place of final punishment. This will be the fate of real people and people that we know. And that is something that we must work through here. What causes my heart to ache? I'm going to quote, I think this is from Francis Chan's book, Erasing Hell. Uh, what, what causes my heart to ache right now as I'm writing this is that my life shows very little evidence that I actually believe this. This is Francis Chan speaking about hell. Every time my thoughts wander to the future of unbelievers, I quickly brush them aside so they don't ruin my day. But there is a reality here that I can't ignore. Even as the conversations of people around me fill my ears, the truth of scripture penetrates my heart with sobering statements about their destinies. We can talk about the fate of some hypothetical person, but as I look up and see their smiles, I have to ask myself if I really believe what I've written in this book, Hell is for Real, Am I? That was Chan and, and Sprinkle in their book, Erasing Hell and Dealing with the Realities of Hell. So dealing honestly with the biblical truth that God will judge the wicked brings us face to face with God's absolute holiness and his purity without any sort of boasting or, or gloating. Um, it also ought to motivate us to pray for and reach out to our unbelieving friends with the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, we cannot boast or gloat only in the cross like Paul did. Um, but we must reach out to our unbelieving friends. Second application, God's judgment is rendered on the basis of divine initiative and human uh, responsibility. So the two sets of books, the book of life and, and the books, the book of works, as we called it earlier, point to the importance of both God's sovereignty and our response of faith. In Revelation and in the rest of the Bible, in my view, it is not either or, but both and. And so uh, we believe God is sovereign over all salvation, but there must be human responsibility that uh, responds and repents and believes. So God's sovereignty stands as one of the main themes of the entire book of Revelation, while human choices carry eternal significance. The importance of listening to the Spirit throughout the seven letters in chapters 2 and 3, and of the failing to repent in 9, 20, uh, you know, and you see the verses there. We trust the Holy Spirit to draw sinners to salvation, to uh, the, the revelation says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit speaks to the churches. And so grace and, and repentance are something the Spirit works in us and grants to us. And we have to, um, we have to repent and believe uh, in, that, um, in our reaction to what God's doing to be saved. A genuine faith, uh, this is third final application, must not be only a believed faith, but also a lived faith. So Revelation does not stand in conflict with the Pauline doctrine, that's Paul, of justification by faith, but it emphasizes, along with James and even Paul, that true faith will be revealed through its actions. Faith without works is dead. Uh, we, we have to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Everyone that is a genuine Christian will produce fruit, and that is shown uh, in this passage tonight, one of the book's central verses Revelation 12, verse 11, they conquered him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, but they did not love their lives to the point of death. This verse highlights, by the way, both the finished work of Christ, his work, and then our active response to that, our testimony. And so both are happening there. If we are Christians, the, the testimony will flow from us in some way. There will be evidence and work uh, that will produce from us. We don't work towards our salvation. We're saved 
by grace, but then works follow and they are produced. Sometimes we drift into thinking that following Christ is more about knowing than about living. But Jesus commanded his disciples to teach others to obey everything I've commanded you, not merely to know his commands. And so this text provides a crucial opportunity to examine our own lives and to make sure that our faith is a lived and expressed faith. I would encourage all of you tonight, search yourself, see if you're in the faith. And if you have any concerns about that, don't, don't be embarrassed to reach out to me or another pastor here and, and let us know if you're having doubts or concerns about your salvation. We want to help you through that. I've got all the Old Testament connections. To be honest, we read these, a lot of these when we work through. So I'm going to leave these for the notes that you can download later, as, as we usually do. But all of these uh, verses we've read tonight uh, stand pretty heavily on Old Testament passages and complement them. Here's a recap of these few verses. The unrepentant dead will face God's judgment. God's judgment is rendered on the basis of divine initiative and human responsibility. In the end, God will cast death, Hades, and the unrepentant into the lake of fire. In conclusion, before we open up for discussions, in an interview in the year 2001, Boxing champion Muhammad Ali was asked if there was anything he was afraid of, and his response was fascinating. He said, I'm afraid of not going to heaven, and Ali is very wise to have such a fear. The great preacher from the early church, John Chrysostom, wisely advised, let us think often of hell, lest we fall into it. And Charles Spurgeon, uh, one of my favorite preachers, he adds, think lightly of hell, and you will soon think lightly of the cross. He who does not believe that God will cast unbelievers into hell will not be sure that he will take believers into heaven. And so C.S. Lewis, we got to quote him, uh, the thoughts of this great writer, no one ever goes to heaven deservingly, and no one ever goes to hell unwillingly. And so he had a lot to say about that. So how appropriate that the one who died so that we should not suffer punishment actually will judge those who have rejected his grace. Spurgeon again says, he shall be the judge. He shall lay open the thoughts and intent of the heart. There will be no witness needed to convict you for the judge will know all of the evidence. The, the Christ whom you despise will judge you, the Savior whose mercy you trampled on, in the fountain of whose blood you would not wash, you would not wash in the, the despised and the rejected, it is he who will judge you. And so that is the sobering thought that we uh, end tonight's study on. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing there. I will open it up. I know usually we get a lot of questions a lot of Q&A, so let me also stop sharing on all of our live stream services here. So if you're watching us on the live stream, join with us.